So, James, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for spending your Friday afternoon recording with us on Talent Hub Talk. Um, really good to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Thanks for inviting me. So we've got quite a few things to run through today. Um, I, I've got a number of topics that I'm keen to discuss. Um, I always start with a bit of background. So um, people know you who, for who you are today in the Salesforce ecosystem. But um, what did you do before before Salesforce? Yeah, sure, sure. So after school, I uh, actually went a, a different direction. I, I did an arts economics degree at uh, university, but I was always interested in computers. So I always had like as a hobby into IT and so on. So I went to uni. Uh, after uni, I, I moved into an IT job, like a customer service job, like on the phones, you know, answering calls for actually a company to uh, age myself, uh, WordPerfect, which was a word processor company back in the day. Yep. Um, so I used to take calls about, uh, you know, from old ladies at Christmas time who wanted to print their uh, Christmas labels and they couldn't make their print, their, the labels print out correctly. Yeah. So, so anyway, but that was a, it was a good job. It was a fun company. It was like a growing sort of American software vendor. So uh, it was like a, a good time and I was young and it was all great. Um, and then moving into, they got purchased by Novell, a networking company. So I started learning more about networking and internet stuff and a bit of Unix, uh, sort of some more sort of deeper technologies. Uh, I had a good time there. After that, I moved into the integration space, working again for an American software vendor. Mm -hmm. So a company called Web Methods or Software AG. So uh, yeah, and that was good because integration is, is a great area to be in because you get a bit of everything. Sure. Like we, we were integrating with billing systems, with SAP, with Siebel uh, and so on. So I get a little bit of knowledge about, you know, a lot of a big range of stuff. Yeah. Um, and I was a I was a post sales consultant, if you like. So I was implementing integration sort of a uh, platforms for for various big companies um so i did that for a few years uh but i as i was going through that i, I wanted to i, I wanted to be, do more people management so i was uh you know, looking for roles where i could manage a team and grow a team and uh, a role came up in finance um uh, at perpetual uh so i uh, i took that role managing a small team who did a bit of integration some finance systems um and uh and some other sort of internal workflow type solutions sure so uh leading that team mm -hmm. so uh, did salesforce then come under that remit and of like, managing a team doing salesforce work yeah yeah actually so what happened is then i got promoted to be the, like, the development manager so managing the whole team and they use salesforce so petrol was one of the early uh, users of salesforce uh, in australia in finance especially um so then in that elevated position Salesforce came into my world more. And so I, I did a little bit there. So it was not, I didn't really know a lot about Salesforce. Like my team were kind of managing it. Sure. But I was working in projects, you know, hearing what was going on, seeing the good things. It was, um, when was it? That was like 2008, 2009, something like that. So it was early days. Salesforce looked uh, pretty different back then. Yeah. Um, yeah, I bet. And uh, yeah, so so my team were doing that. So that's where I got my first sort of taste of it. And that's really where I saw the power of, of products like Salesforce with their with the with the cloud based products where we no longer have to worry about infrastructure, really. Sure. So were mm. you um, you were a development manager at that point, but and you'd done integration. Was that were, were you a, a coder? Like, is that is that the, when you'd gone into the integration space? writing lots of code and did you keep that aspect if so did you keep that aspect mm. as you became the development manager i mean to be honest i've never been much of a coder so really? i mean the only code i have like in the integration space i would take someone else's code and change it slightly yeah like that was, that's the extent of my coding i would never even pretend that i was a, a coder sure and, and my whole career really I, i've been like that i've relied on much more clever people than me to do the the coding sure i can i can read code i can look at it i can troubleshoot it I could change it slightly, but I definitely, if you came to me and said, please build this app, I would have no, win, no idea where to start. So yeah, yeah. I, 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 it's good that you, you've you got to know your weaknesses. Um, I wish I knew more, but I don't. So, you know, I sort of work around it at more of the sort of architecture type level. Sure. Because then um, it was just interesting because you had the development manager title and it's, um, it, it's so interesting how different roles in different companies mean different things. Um, but your role there was to really manage a team of, of the doers. Yeah, that's right. And really, you know, I put my faith in my team. So I, you know, empower people to do their jobs. I ask questions and make sure, you know, I've got enough knowledge to be dangerous. 
but not a but I put my faith in in you know good people who know what they're doing. So sure. Yeah. So mm -hmm. then then from Perpetual you went to Salesforce, um, the mm -hmm. the company. Um, what was the market like at that time? Was that like did you see that as a risky move because Salesforce was still kind of emerging in the region, or was it you you knew there was that that scale and growth coming? No, I knew. I mean, I was really, it actually, I mean, this sounds a bit hokey, but um, when I was working with Vetrol and I, I saw Salesforce, I, I actually communicated with one of my friends saying, Salesforce is the place I'd like to work at, you know, eventually without, this was way before I even thought about, you know, moving across. Sure. Because um, I saw the, I mean, they were already growing, you know, they've been growing 25% a quarter for a very long time. So there was massive growth there. But I could also see the way that Vetrol and other companies were using it that it, there was going to be, you know, nothing stopping them, uh, especially, you know, looking at, at their competitors like Siebel at the time, who were, you know, were, were not moving in the right direction. So I could, I could tell that there's going to be a lot of growth potential there. And then, um, so you went from Perpetual to Salesforce and your role was architect? Yeah, that's right. So I was a technical architect at Salesforce um, for, for, for four and a half years or so. Yeah. Um, and so that was all about, um, you know, implementing Salesforce solutions for our customers. So, sure. I mean, touching on what I said before, you know, I wasn't writing code generally. It was more config advice, review, uh, project planning, uh, helping customers understand what Salesforce can and can't do, and then making sure the projects got delivered. So it was a, a very delivery focused role. And um, and delivery is something that I've, I've pretty much done for most of my career, you know, yeah. and it's something I really love the excitement of uh, delivering projects and, and sort of getting them uh, from uh, from start to finish. Sure. So what did you most enjoy um, about working at Salesforce, the company, and kind of what did you get from that experience? Yeah. Well, I mean, it was a growing company. So I would say to anyone, working for a growing company is much more fun than working for a declining company because uh, there's a lot of uh, – you get a lot more opportunities. You get a lot more, you know, companies that are growing want to do stuff and they're prepared to take risks. Um, so at Salesforce, they were definitely like that. You know, there were lots of opportunities to do different things. There were lots of opportunities to take risks, to improve the way the services team was working and work with our colleagues. Um, there was, um, you know, heaps of technology. Obviously, even back then, Salesforce, you know, they bought Exact Target. They bought other sort of, uh, you know, Radiant 6 when I was there. All these new technologies were coming on board constantly. They were building a lot of stuff. So you had heaps to learn, which was great, which is something I enjoy. I've always enjoyed technology. So there was no chance of getting bored. And there was a, you know, a constant movement at Salesforce. It was always grow, 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 and, um, and so on. So it was really good. And the people in services and, and sales are really, I have to say, you know, honestly, that the, the people that I worked with back then in services and sales were Overall, the best, the most brightest people that I've worked with in a company, you know, as a as in a whole organization. Obviously, I've worked with I work with lots of bright people today, uh, but as an organization, they had you know pretty much everyone at Salesforce was was very smart and clever and driven. Sure, and and now you're in the public sector space, so you're you're um, leading a, a big team, you're leading a practice um, within public sector. Um, so a few years ago, we saw public sector absolutely take off um, with Salesforce, uh, and it's just been kind of constant growth, right? The m especially um, where we are in New South Wales, we're just seeing more and more departments coming onto the platform. Why do you think it's such a good platform for government departments, and why has there been so much growth? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know. Platforms like Salesforce doesn't have to be Salesforce. It is very attractive to government because they're they're compliant, they're audited, they're reliable. You don't have to worry about that anymore. You know, we don't have to worry about servers. We don't have to worry about um, you know has it been ISO nine thousand and one certified? Are the data centers secure? Because we've we've given that to Salesforce to manage, and mm -hmm. we've pre agreed with them as part of you know government agreements that they do things uh, according to government standards. So it takes a lot of the worry around. Uh, around that away from, from people like me who are building uh, Salesforce solutions for government. Um, it also, uh, I mean, the platform also lets you move very quickly. So, you know, any larger enterprise, whether it's government or non-government, I think in the past, many of them have, have experienced IT projects which move very slowly, take a long time, and their success is, you know, dubious. So you spend a lot of money and at the end, you might not get exactly what you want. But platforms like Salesforce mean that we can move much quicker. We can do things very cheaply. We can involve the business with us, you know, prototype as we go. 
they can see it, they give us feedback before we finish. And so we know we're on the right track without spending you know, millions of dollars. And then we can get them a solution very quickly. And we know that solution is going to work. It's not going to crash. It's not going to fall over. It's not going to run out of space. And um, and we also know how much it costs us each year exactly. We don't have to think about, oh, what about if the server blows up? We're going to have to pay another you know, $20,000 to IBM to replace it. Yeah, so sure. It's those kind of things. So they're the really attractive things. Salesforce is also engaged really well in government. There's um, there's a strong government community. So there's a good government user group, uh, which is sort of run by Department of Customer Service. Um, so I think government as a as a community is very strong. You know, where where government employees are in it generally for the greater good. You know, we're not we're not doing this to make a profit. Mm -hmm. We're not doing this to sort of sell more widgets and get you know an extra five percent on the, of, of our revenue. We're doing this to provide services to the whole community, even the, the small groups in the community, not just the ones who are going to spend money with us. Sure. So, so that gives a good a good way, a good feeling for us to work with one another and help one another. And so, um, yeah, so I think that has also helped and, and Salesforce has encouraged that community. So I think that's also assisted with the success of Salesforce in, in New South Wales government. Yeah, nice. And uh, another topic um, that I'm keen to discuss is, is Salesforce teams because we, we've touched on it. Obviously, you've, you've always kind of been about managing people and, and you've, you've really enjoyed that aspect. Um, mm -hmm. And you have built a practice, right? You've got a, a big team of Salesforce professionals, um, but you do use partners. So you will supplement that mm -hmm. team with partners um, for, for specific projects. So how do you get that balance right? Because I find that some companies just use partners and, and maybe have one person looking after the platform and uh, other people just just um, try to give everything to their internal team. So how do you make sure that your internal team are getting mm -hmm. good work and enjoyable work, but you are getting the right partners in at the right time? Yeah, yeah, sure. So generally, my my first protocol is to do the work internally if I if I can, if I have the capacity and the, the skill set. So if you know someone comes to me and they need a solution delivered in in the next month, and my team is already busy, that's the type of uh, opportunity that's where I'd go to a partner and say, "Look, I need someone to sort of augment my team." And generally, my preference is that is that I have a couple of people from my team or one or two people from my team working with the partner so that we don't lose that IP you know, after the project is delivered. So it's it's more around capacity, but also specialist skills. So we're, we're probably likely to do a, a new project shortly with Field Service Lightning, and that's not something that we've done uh, before at Transport. So my team aren't familiar with it. It gives us the ability, the people who build it uh, in my team are definitely going to support it. So having that being across the, the project and what was built means that when we hand it over to support, which may be the same people or it might be different people in my team, uh, it's very easy for us. So the knowledge is already there. They, they've built it. They've understood it. They've been across it. They know that, you know, they've been talking to their colleagues. So, yeah, it makes it much easier handover to operations because my team also do the uh, operations and the BAU. So your internal team have acted as a consulting um, partner to other divisions of New South Wales government. Um, so actually delivering projects for other departments based on the, the skills mm -hmm. and knowledge that you have. How did that come about and what does that look like? Yeah, yeah, that's, it, that's been really exciting. That's been, I think, good for, for transport and good for my team as well. Um, the way it came about really initially was when I joined transport, uh, our management were keen to use the skills that we have within transport, not just in Salesforce, but, you know, PMs, BAs, uh, you know, spatial people. And they, they saw that we had all these great people uh, and sometimes they had capacity. And so why don't we try and help other government agencies do things better? So that was the, the mindset from management. So when I joined, um, I uh, as part of the government community, you know, I, I met people and was talking to them about what we're doing at Transport. And it started off with something small where I, I just did a little bit of a small engagement with another department for advice. So we did a bit of a review of their project. And, uh, and the model we use is like a partner. So we have day rates, we charge out our team, you know, we do an SOW and, and we deliver the services, so much like a partner. Uh, so we did a little bit of advice work uh, and then we actually picked up a, a larger project for another department to actually build it. So we, we put people on that team and then we built out um, uh, a project which uh, is being used across New South Wales government now. And, and from there, we've done other projects uh, in for other departments and yeah, you know, and, and continue that work. Sometimes it's actually you know providing BAs, testers, developers, Salesforce functional consultants. Sometimes it's just providing an architect. 
sometimes you know it's it's a bit of a mix. So it, it's been it's been um, it's been good. Uh, it's good for good for transport in that it means that I can have a larger team who are who are paid for, uh, and I can that means I can provide more services to transport. Uh, but it also means that my team, like you said before, uh, are learning more. Uh, you know, they, they get to do something different. They're not just doing transport stuff. They're doing you know a bit of you know projects in other areas, um, using other technologies, working with other people, seeing how other people run projects. So it's it's good for their motivation too. A consulting company within a business as well. It's um, it's kind of very different to what lots of people would experience in in a role like yours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's exciting. Like I, I can't say it's always fun, but uh, it's mainly fun. It's it's pretty busy sometimes, and there's uh there's, a, there's times where it's been challenging. Um, you know, the, the 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 department isn't set up to do this kind of thing. You know, necessarily, it's not something we do commonly. Sure. Uh, so there's, there's challenges. You know, working across organisations like anyone would experience. So, uh, but uh, but I you know I have to say that they, they've been successful so far, and they're going well. And the ones we're doing now are. Um, are good and I think the customers of the other departments really value it. They see, they see a trusted government colleague who is doing the work for them. Yeah. They they appreciate the flexibility we have. Like sometimes we have to stop because they they're not ready, and you know I have more flexibility than maybe a, a private partner does to just say, okay, guys, we're going to go and do some other work now for the next sort of month or two. Um, say this COVID nineteen sort of work that we've been doing lately. That's pretty much what we did. I know um, that it's difficult to hire Salesforce professionals. I think, um, you know, I've, I've been around the market long enough to see the, the trends, but um, on the whole, it's, um, it, it's pretty tough to get good people. So what, what kind of challenges have you faced mm -hmm. with building a team uh, and getting the right skills in the team? Yeah, yeah. Look, I, mean, I think I've been pretty lucky. I mean, maybe it's because, you know, I sort of worked at Salesforce and I, I've known people and I've, I've been around a, a little bit in that, you know, my network is, is reasonable. Um, but, but, you know, I, I've, I think I've also been pretty lucky with the, with the hires that we've made. Um, the, yeah, I mean, it, it's sometimes challenging to get people, you know, for the, for the money with the right skills, you know, as you would well know and other people would know, especially in a, in a growing market like Salesforce. Um, but, I think people see the value of working for a for a government agency and a team like mine, where first of all the work they're doing is meaningful. You know, we're, we're providing valuable services for for the community, uh, but there's also you know there's there's work life benefits and and they you know it's a good team. They're going the project work is helpful. They're going to be learning new things. Yeah, I think that's key that you can offer that whether you're a government department or a a not for profit company or a, a private company making profit. Then I think. Um, yeah, that that's kind of key. That's what people really want. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, you don't want to be you don't want to be bored at work. You don't want to be just doing the same thing, um, especially like you know, Salesforce is a is still a relatively new, exciting technology. So, the people involved with it are they're not they haven't just given up on their career. They're not just like I want sure. to do. I'm okay with how I am. I don't want to keep advancing. So people are, are keen to learn more, and so. Um, yeah, I've seen that. Like, you know, my team, my team of transport is, is fantastic. I'd say like 100% of them are excellent. They're, you know, very well certified. They're constantly letting me know they're getting new certifications in their spare time. Um, what What are the kind of core skills that you look for from any of your hires, aside from the technical stuff or the certifications? What's really important to you when someone's coming in for an interview? What do you look for? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I've hired people into my team who've turned out to be incredible with no Salesforce skills. So Salesforce skills, you know, sometimes obviously I'm looking for that. Other times I'm just looking for a history of customer engagement and customer service and sort of what do you want to call it, functional consulting skills, because I know that people can learn Salesforce quite quickly if they're motivated. Um, so, so I've got a bit of a mix. I'd say when I interview people, yeah, I'm, I'm looking for logical people, people who can communicate well, people who are self-reliant, uh, so you know, who I'm going to be able to trust to put in front of the business and let them get on with it. And uh, and, and the projects that I do with my team, um, you know, I'm not micromanaging them. I'm not. I give them the projects. You know, I, I work on that sort of working with the business to determine what's a good project or a bad project. But once we once we identify the project and it's going ahead. I'm very hands off. I'm there for escalations only, and I, I let the team manage that. So I need that self reliance and that confidence uh, yep. in themselves to know what to do. And I, I'm, I can say honestly that you know all my team are like that today, and definitely easygoing. I'd say you know our team is very relaxed. It's not a 
there's not a lot of uh, you know high pressure sort of pieces there. There's not a lot of shouting or screaming from anyone. There's still a lot more growth to be seen in the government space, but um, it's really interesting to hear how you're you're adding value both to your internal stakeholders, but also the broader government departments. Um, and also, I think there's lots of value in there for people that are looking to to, to grow teams. So, if someone uh, does want to reach out to pick your brains around how you've done any of the things you've done, where where's the best place to get in touch? Uh, LinkedIn's probably the easiest. So just look me up on LinkedIn. But yeah, I'm happy to help anyone who wants to get some advice. Thank you.